when I was in college, sometime in college, I began to carry around a calendar, a little pocket calendar. This was before, you know, smartphones and even computers. It was a couple years before everybody started having a computer. So I started carrying around this, this calendar. I don't know, I, I don't even recall, you know, how that all happened. I'm sure somebody somewhere along the line encouraged me, hey, you know, you got more things going on in life now. You need to jot some things down so that you don't forget. And so that's what I did. I took that challenge and I began to carry this around. It was pretty simple. You know, each page had a, had a different uh, month of the year. And, and those months were broken down into weeks. And then the weeks were broken down into days. And there was just little squares. And you could just jot something important that was going to happen that day. You know, like if I, had a, if I had a class paper that was due on a particular day or I was going to have an exam, you know, I'd, I'd write down a couple of weeks beforehand, write it down there so that I could re remember and know that I had that coming up, a sporting event or, you know, significant things writing on that calendar so that I, that I knew what was going to happen. Um, if somebody asked me, you know, hey, what's going on this week? Do you have something going on this day? I could pull out my calendar and flip through it and go, no, I'm actually free. Um, since then, it's gotten a little more uh, advanced. You know, now my calendar is on all my devices, my computer, my smartphone, my tablet. And instead of just being what happens during the day, now it's broken down into what's happening every hour. <laughs> Uh, so it's a little bit more complex than it used to be. But the, but the point is the same, right? It's, it's keeping track of what's going on, the events, whether they're near or far in life. Somebody says, well, does it really help? And I'd say, yeah, it helps as long as you look at it. If you don't look at it, it doesn't help very much because then you're going to forget right? I found out even with my devices, one of the nice little uh, things that these things have now is that they, they warn you of stuff coming up, right? You can have a little alarm go off. And it warn well, and again, that's good as long as you take notice of the alarm. If, if you ignore the alarm or you go, oh yeah, I know that's coming, and you turn it off and, and then forget two minutes later, like I sometimes do, it doesn't really help you that much. A calendar is only beneficial, a schedule is only beneficial if you take time to look at it and you're reminded of what's going on. Now, God has a calendar. It's not a literal calendar where he has to write things down, write important events down so that he doesn't forget them. God doesn't forget anything. God's calendar is not for him, it's for us. As we go through his word, we're told about certain events. Some are events that have taken place in the past, which is a majority of scripture, but there are many events that are talked about in the future. And there are events that aren't necessarily uh, day specific. We can't go and say, well, this is going to happen on this specific day, on this specific year, at this specific hour. But they are events that God has given us beforehand, we call it prophecy. And this calendar that I'm referred to, uh, referring to many times is referred to as God's prophetic calendar. And this morning, I want to talk to you about what I believe and many believe is the next important event on God's prophetic calendar. It's an event called, many times referred to as the rapture of the church. And in order for us to understand this fully, we're going to look at some background first. We're going to look at the reality of God's wrath. And we're going to talk about the rapture from the wrath. And then we're going to close out and we're going to talk about how we should respond to this rapture, this whole thing. So, we got a lot to cover this morning. I'm going to give you a lot of scripture. And... Uh, my, my hope and prayer is that you can just kind of zero in for the next few minutes because I believe that this is super important for us to understand. So before we jump into everything, let's review a little bit because last week connects to this week. Last week, 
Last week, we looked at Matthew chapter 24, and if you remember the whole deal, Jesus is, has just pronounced judgment on the religious uh, community. He's pronounced judgment on Israel, and the, the disciples and, and Jesus are leaving the temple area, and it just seems like for sure the disciples are trying to figure this whole thing out. What on earth is this all about? What has Jesus just done? And so it may be that in the process they're trying to kind of deflect from the conversation and move to something else that could kind of maybe take the conversation to a more po positive place. And they say, wow, look at this temple. Isn't this an amazing temple? And we talked about the temple last week and how how why that would be the case that they would look at it because it was a pretty magnificent amazing thing and that didn't distract Jesus at all from talking about what was going to happen and the destruction that was coming in fact it seems to kind of accelerated the whole conversation and Jesus says yeah you see all these rocks these beautiful buildings not one stone is going to be left on top of the other now, that must have absolutely blew the disciples away. And so when they find themselves a little bit later on outside of the city, sitting in this olive grove on a hill, looking down into the city, they said, Jesus, can you tell us what are the signs of the end and when are you going to return? And Jesus launches into this explanation of things near the end. We call it the Olivet Discourse. It's Jesus' teaching and message to the Twelve on what was coming. And last week we just took the first 14 verses and we zeroed in on seven signs that Jesus gave with regard to the end. And he, he talked about in, the increase of false messiahs. He talked about the increase in war. He talked about the increase in natural disasters. And by the way, I don't know if you saw that this this week, but it caught my attention a couple of days ago that the UN has just uh, commissioned uh, something like one and a half billion dollars for a worldwide uh, weather emergency uh, warning system because natural disasters have accelerated 40, over 40% 40 more in the last 50 years. And so they're, they're commissioning this worldwide weather emergency system. Um, he talked about increase in the persecution of Christians, an increase in the deterioration of relationships. The love of many will grow cold. There'll be lawlessness. Man, I read about some stuff this week. It's just like, how can people do this? This woman, I was reading about this just the other day, this woman in Milwaukee, she... she um, these, these girls came to her, these teenage girls, and told them uh, that they were being uh, sexually abused and that they were being trafficked. And she had such compassion on them that she said, well, you can come and stay with me and we'll figure this thing out together. And so she brings them into her home. And, and sometime at night, they take her three-month-old baby and steal it. And you read that kind of stuff and you go, How? Now, praise the Lord, the authorities were able to find these girls and get the baby back. But still, how does this kind of thing happen? I read about another story this week where this couple was on a jet ski, and, and the jet ski, uh, they, they got thrown off the jet ski, and this older couple that was on a boat saw them and came and, and rescued them out of the water. And the guy that got rescued ends up beating up the old man, and it's just nuts just crazy and you go how where are we we're more and more digressing into a lawless society and I wasn't going to go there because we need to just get through these but an increase in false prophets and an increase in gospel proclamation that was the only positive one we said out of the whole lot that the, the, the gospel message will be proclaimed in an accelerated way and we are seeing that there's evidence of that not here, but in other parts of the world, it's accelerating. Remember, Jesus compared these signs to, to the pains of a woman in birth. And, and the idea is we look at those things and go, wow, pff, all those things have been happening for, pff, you know, centuries, thousands of years. And that is true. They, they have been. But Jesus was very specific in saying it will be like a woman giving birth uh, going into labor. What, what is that? What's he trying to tell us? 
that these pains, these birth pains, will increase in frequency and in intensity as time goes on. So he's telling us, don't, it's not necessarily these things that you're looking at, but you're looking at these things intensifying in frequency and in intensity over a period of time. And these things will increase and get more and more and more and more and more. And scripture tells us that they will, they will begin to really explode in happening during a period that's, that, that we refer to as the tribulation period. And Jesus describes this period in Matthew 24 and verse 21. Listen to what he says. For there will be greater anguish the word literally is tribulation, than at any time since the world began. And it will never be so great again. This, this period that we know as the tribulation is when all these types of things that Jesus described that we looked at last week will just be really, it's, again, think of a woman uh, about ready to give birth. Now they're coming frequently and the intensity is really harsh and this is that time period. We get another description of it. Revelation chapter 6, verse 15. It says this, And everyone, the kings of the earth, the rulers, the generals, the wealthy, the powerful, and every slave and free person all hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they cried to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the greater day of their wrath has come, and who is able to survive? This is just a picture, a snapshot of this time period where all of these things that Jesus is talking about in Matthew 24 accelerate to such a point that it is a time of great tribulation. And, and look what it says. This is amazing the way that this is even worded. Um, the, 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 they hide from the face of the one who sits on the throne, that's God, and from the wrath of the Lamb. That's a reference to Jesus, right? But look what it says. The wrath of the Lamb. Have you ever seen an angry lamb before? I mean, stop and think about it. All these pictures of sheep, you know, they're always just kind of these placid little, the lamb's mad now. John said, when, when John saw Jesus coming to be baptized, John said, look, the lamb of God, what? Who takes away the sin of the world. See, because he came the first time to do that. But in this situation, it's not the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. This is the Lamb of God that judges the sin of the world. And it's referred to as wrath. You say, wait a minute, man. <laughs> what, what is this? Like, where's, where's the love of God here? Where's the love of Jesus? What, what is this wrath stuff? What is this judgment thing? If you're taking notes this morning, put this down. The wrath of God is God's anger directed towards sin and fueled by his passion for justice. God is a just God. God is, yes, God is a God of love. This gets a little hard to, to break down and follow, but all of the things that we call God's attributes... He doesn't have those in sections. Like sometimes I think we think of God like a pie, and one slice is love, and this slice is justice, and this slice is mercy, and this slice is holy. God is not a God of parts. God doesn't change from one emotion to another like we do. Everything that God is, He is holy. In other words, He is all love, He is all justice, He is all mercy all the time. He doesn't move from one to the other. Okay, we, that's, that's a very difficult thing for us to conceptualize because we do move from one to the other. God is not like that. Remember, he is not like us. We are like him to a certain degree. 
because he has chosen to, to give us certain aspects of who he is, we can be loving, right? We can show mercy and show care, but we can never do it like God does. See, because God is holy in all of that. And remember, holy means separate, distinct, other than. So when we talk about God being holy, we mean God is, he is absolutely, totally different than we are. And so we might have a love, a type of love, but God's love is a holy love. It's in a whole other league than our love. We may talk about God's uh, uh, justice and our justice. We can be just people at times, but our justice is always imperfect God's justice is a holy justice. It's in a league all its own. And so when we, when we start talking about these things, when we start talking about God's justice, and even when we talk about God's anger, it's in a totally different league than ours. See, we could have, hopefully at times, righteous anger. You know, for instance, when we see innocent children being abused, it should bring this anger in us that this is wrong and that's a righteous anger but God's anger is not just righteous it's holy it's in a whole different league than ours it's never wrong our anger can be wrong because it can be self-motivated but God's is never wrong it's a holy anger so important for us to understand and so when when God brings justice he has to because he's a just God. And that justice is not separated from his love. It's motivated by his love. And we look at things in the world right now and we go, yeah, you know, we need some of that justice. Where is it? You know, what is, what on earth, God? What are you waiting for? Why is he delaying? And he's delaying because of his grace, right? We get a picture of this in, in 2 Peter. Peter's writing to these folks, and in chapter 3, he's trying to encourage them because they're coming, up against, they're coming up against a lot of opposition. And he tells them in verse 3 and 4 of chapter 3 in 2 Peter, he says, look, in the last days... There's going to be people that come along and they're going to be skeptics and they're going to be mockers and they're going to say something like this. So where is Jesus? I mean, you guys have been talking about this Jesus coming back for a long time. Where is he at? I mean, we've been going through centuries and centuries of stuff and we don't see any Jesus. Maybe you got this thing wrong. Then he goes on in verse 5 and 6 and he says something very interesting. He says that these folks deliberately forget that God is the creator. And beyond that, they forget about the time that God did judge, called the flood, where God took the water that he had used in creation and used it to destroy all of mankind, except for Noah and his family. He said these mockers and these skeptics, they willfully forget that. And then he goes on in verse 7 of that chapter and he says, the same word of God that created will be the same word of God that will bring this judgment of destruction. And then he says something very interesting in verse 8. Listen, you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years is like a day. Now, we love to use that for different things, and I got a hunch that when you've used it, you really have no idea what you're saying. Because let me tell you what this is saying. God, as creator, started it all. Genesis 1.1, in the what? Beginning. That means there was a beginning. That means that before the beginning, there was God. Guess what? At the beginning... Space, time, and matter started. That means that's where time started. Before the beginning, there was no time. There was only God. You say, Rand, how's that work? I don't know. I'm not God. But we know that there was a beginning. Listen, 
I'm not even giving you, this isn't even some metaphysical philosophy. This is science, right? They refer to it as the Big Bang. You follow everything back, and it comes to this one point of singularity where there is this immense power, they say, and boom, it all came to be. And they'll tell you that is where space, time, and matter began. That is where time began. So this God who existed, who made this happen, existed outside of time before time. God is not stuck on days, minutes, hours like you and I. That's what this is saying. A thousand years to God is like a day. What it's saying is, it's not saying, oh, well, a day to God is like a thousand years. That means he has some pretty long days. No, don't miss the point. He's tying this in with creation and God being the creator. What he's saying is God is not strapped to time at all. So when you and I look and say, what is God waiting for? That's only you and me wondering what he's waiting for. He's not stuck in a time frame like we are. Then he goes on and he says this in verse 9, and this is what I really wanted to draw your attention to. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to repent. Why is God delaying? Why hasn't he judged already? Because he doesn't want everybody to be destroyed. He wants them to repent. And you say, well, why doesn't God force them to repent? Because that wouldn't be true repentance. You can't force love. Force love is no love at all. Love has to choose. And God is giving choice to his people. And he says, look, I don't want you. I'm going to send you all kinds of prophets. I'm going to send you my word. I'm going to send you my son. I'm going to send you signs. And all of these things are to get you to come to a point where you understand you need me. You can't do it eternity without me. And so his goal is to get people to repent. And then the very next verse says this, but, but, he's, he's delaying, but the day of the Lord will come unexpectedly as a thief. So he says, look, God is delaying. It's because of his grace and his mercy and the desire for everybody to repent. But don't you dare think that those skeptics and mockers are right. He's coming. The day of the Lord is coming. Acts 17, Paul said it like this as he's speaking in verse 30. He says, look, God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times. But now he commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and to turn to him. For he has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed, and he proved to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead. Did you realize that Easter is tied to judgment? It's tied to the, 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 the veracity that Jesus is, is the one God has chosen to be the judge of the world. And Paul's saying right here, look, God is looking the other way, basically. That's kind of the picture here. That's not really what's happening. But he's saying, look, God is willing to say, you guys are ignorant, and I want to give you time. I want to, I want to give you an opportunity to repent, and I'm calling you to repentance. But know this, there is a day and time set for this judgment. And in Romans 2, 4, we see this. This is, this is so clear. He says, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that it is His kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Because you're stubborn and you refuse to turn from your sin, you are storing up terrible punishment for yourself. For a day of anger is coming. The word literally there is wrath. A day of wrath is coming where God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Why? Because a righteous, just God has to judge 
injustice. And notice how this is, this is worded. He says you're, you're storing up terrible punishment for yourself. It's a picture almost like a dam. You know, you think of a dam and it holds back all this water. Uh, uh, Kale and I, this, this past summer, we were fishing at this dam. And we were just, just downstream. I mean, literally, you could just see this whole uh, work of this, of this dam. And it was just, it was amazing. As we stood there looking at this thing, you go, man, that is holding back billions of gallons of water. And, and then there's this little stream coming out from the bottom. And you go, if that thing ever broke, man, we would be, do you think we could outrun it, Kale? you think we could outrun this? Because you're dreaming, Dad. I might be able to outrun it, but you're never going to be able to outrun it. <laughs> But so we're looking at this, this massive dance, amazing edifice. And, and there's this stream coming, this, this small river coming out of it, right? And that's a picture here. It's like God is saying, look, you guys, this is coming. And if you don't repent, it, you are storing up. It's like the, the water is just stacking behind these walls. And, and guess what? During history, there is a stream of judgment that flows out. We see it all through Scripture. We saw it with the flood. We saw it with the, with the plagues in Egypt. You, you see it in just a variety of ways even today where you can go, man, this is, this is God saying, look, wake up, wake up. You think this is bad now. Guess what? There is judgment coming. And when that dam breaks, watch out and that's the picture here we look around at the times that we're living in and we go man how can God let people get away with this kind of stuff things are so bad people are so evil and let me tell you something God is the great equalizer and it may, be, it may appear that people get away with things now but this life is not all there is and you will not you will not skirt the justice of an absolutely holy, just God. And that's the whole point of Jesus. You go, Rand, thanks for the encouragement this morning. This is great stuff. The wrath of God is exactly what I came to church to hear about today so I could go out full and ready for the week. Listen, this is the backdrop. I have to give you this because of what I want to zero in on today. I, I hope you will be encouraged because if you're here this morning and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, I don't believe that you and I will ever go through what I've just described. If I'm understanding Scripture right and, and, and many other, a lot, smarter guys than me understand scripture right, you and I as followers of Jesus Christ will never go through this great time of wrath that I just described, this great time of judgment. There's an event coming on God's prophetic calendar that we refer to as the rapture of the church, and that rapture raptures us from this wrath. And if I just read that passage, that's that's one of the key passages that talks about this event. I want to go back and read it again and zero in on some of the characteristics of the, this event and give you maybe a little bit more clarity as we're finishing up here. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. I would encourage you. It's, on, it's going to be on the screen, but follow along. And, and let me, before we read this, let me give you some background. I think this, is, is, this would be helpful. Paul is writing to this church, this group of Christians in this city called Thessalonica, and he's writing to them because they have been anticipating the Lord's return. You say, well, wait a minute. Uh, I thought we're supposed to anticipate the Lord's return. We are. Every believer since the time that Jesus left this earth is supposed to be anticipating the return of the Lord because we don't know when it's coming. And so Paul had been teaching these folks and other churches that he had started, listen, Jesus is coming back. You need to anticipate that it could be at any time. And so they, they were. But the problem was they began to talk among themselves and somebody said, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. If, if Jesus comes back, what, what about our, our dead family members that have trusted Christ and they die before he comes back? What happens to them? 
And so Paul's partially writing this to explain to them, listen, listen, I, I hear what you're saying and I want to explain some things to you about your, your dead family members who have trusted Christ and what that means when Jesus returns. So that's what's going on here. He says, now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died. Now, I want to stop there for a minute because depending on your translation, that, this is really not a very good translation of that word. And I understand why they did it, but it's so much more meaningful if they just left it alone. The word in the original is not have died. The word in the original is uh, fallen asleep. The word literally means fallen asleep. And you go, oh, well, he's talking about people that have taken a nap. No, no, no. He's talking about people that have died, but they're Christians. And the way he's describing it is they've fallen asleep. See, because you've got to understand, in the New Testament mindset, you and I that have placed our faith in Christ, death is just like taking a big nap. Because the Bible says our, our, our spirit is separated from our body, our spirit goes to be with the Lord, and it's our body that's just kind of laid to rest. That term, laid to rest. And so Paul is using this, talking about they're, they're asleep, right? Think of it like this. You go to a soda machine and you're just all set on getting that ice cold can of intense sugar and chemicals. And you go there and you're ready to put your money in. And there's a sign on it that says, temporarily out of order. And you go, oh, shucks. And you kick the machine. No, you don't kick the machine. You, oh, man, I can't believe that. It's kind of like when you and I in Christ die, they should just put a sign on our casket, temporarily out of order. And that's kind of the picture here. So keep that in mind as we read through this. Now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to believers who have died or fallen asleep. So you won't grieve like people who have no hope. See, there, there's two kinds of grief. There, there's a grief with out hope, a person who doesn't know Christ as Savior, guess what? You're going to grieve without hope for them because they have no hope of standing before God as a forgiven person if they've never placed their faith and trust in Christ. But he's saying that these people, you can grieve for them with hope because you have that confident expectation that they will stand before Jesus. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. You say, Rand? That's really interesting, but I didn't see the word rapture in there at all. And you're right, it's not there. Let me show you where we get that. When he says there in verse 17 that uh, we who are still alive and remain on earth will be caught up, the, the word in the original Greek means to be snatched up, to, to be seized, to be carried the Latin translation of the New Testament is called the Latin Vulgate. It used the word here, rapio, which means to catch up or take away. Rapture is a takeoff of that Latin word. So rapture is just used, it's a, it's a Latin derivative used to describe this event that's being talked about here. That's why if you look at your notes at the, at the top, I titled this message, Snatched Away, because I think that's more true to the original. This is a snatching, that's the picture here, kind of a snatching away, right? 
And I think maybe perhaps that's a little bit more biblical of a term. But I also want to show you real quick just a very simple timeline, a prophetic timeline. And you've got it in your notes, but I want to show it to you here. So guys, could you put that next slide up, please? There we go. So we got the cross where Jesus died. We have the ascension. Jesus goes back up, Acts chapter 1, right? And what do we know from Acts chapter 1? Well, Jesus commissioned his disciples to go into Jerusalem, Judea, and, and the other parts of the world. And then after that, he ascends up into the clouds. And the disciples are standing there watching this whole deal. And two angels show up and they said, hey, why are you guys standing around looking up into the sky? This same Jesus that was taken to, from you, he's going to come back again in the same way you just saw him go. That's the ascension. From the time that Jesus ascended until the time of this event that we're referring to as the rapture, that's the last days. So when Jesus talks in Matthew chapter 24 about these different events that are, they started way before this, but they start to uh, intensify slowly and pick up speed during these last days. Now, the last days have lasted a long time, a couple thousand years up to this point. And then this event called the rapture of the church is when believers are taken up, Jesus has come part way in the clouds, and he takes us up. And then that judgment period that we just read about a little bit earlier is called the tribulation. That's a seven-year period that takes place. And at the very end, Jesus comes back all the way to the earth, and we refer to that as the second coming. Now, this is very important. All of the signs in Scripture point to the second coming. There are no signs for the rapture of the church. Here's the deal, though. If we look and we can say, wow, it looks more and more, as we look at these signs, it looks more and more like the second coming of Christ is close, then what do you think that means for the rapture of the church? It's even closer. See? Now, this is, this is what's referred to in Scripture as a mystery because until it was revealed, it wasn't known. It wasn't, they knew about the second coming of Christ back in the Old Testament. They talked about it. But they didn't know about this event called the rapture of the church. Right? Paul describes it again. I want to read this passage for you in 1 Corinthians 15. Listen to what he says. What I'm saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot in inherit what will last forever. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. Literally, he says a mystery. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown, for when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. You talk about transformers. Man, we will be the transformers at that point. Why? What's Paul saying? Paul's saying, listen... This physical body that is racked with the curse that no matter how hard we try to eat right and exercise still decays and eventually will die, cannot inherit eternity. Something has got to change with this mortal body to make it an immortal body. That's what he's saying. And this will happen at this point. And he's saying it will be boom quick. So, there, there's a lot here, and there is no way in one message that we, we have an uh, opportunity to go through all of this. But very quickly, I want to give you some things that characterize this event. Here's number one. It will be sudden. We just saw that. He says it will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye. In other words, and it fits with what we read in 1 Thessalonians, that we'll be caught up, we'll literally be snatched. The idea is we will be here one moment, and the next moment we're gone. It'll be as if we disappeared. Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians as a blink of an eye, gone. 
It's a sudden deal. It doesn't say that we'll be dragged away to Jesus, right? Wait a minute, wait, whoa! It's blink of the eye, quick, sudden. Here's number two. It will be selective. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, The dead in Christ will rise first. The dead in Christ, believers in Christ. This is for followers of Jesus Christ. Then we, remember he's talking to the church, followers of Jesus Christ, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. This is selective. This is specific. It's not going to be like, oh, dang, how did you get here? It, it's all about followers of Jesus Christ. Right? This is, this is not just an anybody kind of thing, and let's see what we get when we get. It's not like throwing a net and seeing what kind of fish you get. This is specifically, this is, by the way, this is a, a wheat and a tares kind of thing going on here. If you think back to Jesus' parable. Here's number three. It will be spectacular. At least in three ways. There will be in a spectacular announcement. Verse 16 of 1 Thessalonians 4 says this, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Now this is, this is interesting to me. I don't, it doesn't say what's going to be said. But here's something very interesting. You can do with this what you want. It is the same word used in Mark chapter 15 when Jesus is hanging on the cross and it says he cried out before he died. It's the same word. You say, well, Ram, why is that significant? Well, think of one of the major things that he said at the very end. What did he say? It's finished. I mean, wouldn't that be an appropriate thing to all of a sudden have yelled, hey, guess what, you guys? It's done. End of the game. It's all over. I'm taking you home. Huh? I don't know. Don't go out here and say, well, Randy said it's good. I don't know that. But, same word, right? Now, it may be something else, like, come on, you know? Get up here. I, I don't know. It doesn't tell us. It just says there's going to be this, and now it's a shout, and it says the voice of the archangel. As far as we know, archangel, we talked about this back when we talked about um, unseen forces just here a little while ago in our series. We talked about the archangel. An archangel means chief, top. And as far as we know in Scripture, there's only one, and his name is Michael. And so this right-hand man, so to speak, is going to be a part of this deal, this, this angelic being. And it says, with the trumpet of God. Trumpets are significant in Scripture because if you go through the Old Testament, trumpets announced feasts. They announced important days. It was just like, hey, when you heard a trumpet as a Jewish person, this meant something celebratory, something huge, something good. So the idea of a trumpet here is not that we've got to, oh, what is, our, oh, I think it's time, let's get ready. It, it's the idea of celebration. This is, this, listen, you, this is what you've been anticipating, this is what you've been waiting for, boom, it's here. Be spectacular in announcement and it'll be spectacular in change. 1 Corinthians 15, again, he says, I tell you a mystery, you won't all be asleep or you won't all die. We will be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will rise in, uh, first. And we will be changed. There'll be change going on. Spectacular change. This body won't hurt anymore. We won't struggle with cancer anymore. Amen, Harv? Amen? We won't struggle with arthritis. We won't struggle with acid reflux and whatever else is bothering you because the mortal body will take on immortal qualities and then it'll be a spectacular future first Thessalonians 4 17 then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so we shall always be with the Lord I want you to notice something. It doesn't say, and so we shall always be in heaven. Because our goal is in a place. 
It's a person. It's the person of Jesus. Our hearts should long to see the author of life, the one who is love, the one who is justice, the one who is goodness and grace and mercy. And when we see him, who cares about heaven? That's the, that's the picture here. And so will we be with him forever, wherever he is. That is heaven. That's the picture here. So it'll be sudden. It'll be selective. It'll be spectacular. Number four, it will be soon? Question mark? Maybe. I think so. My dad just turned 83, and he will tell you that he is expecting to be raptured out of here. He said, if it, I'm not, it's okay, because I know where I'm going anyway. But he is, he's been anticipating it his whole life, and he expects that he's going to be around for this event. I don't know. We can't set a date. Jesus said in Matthew 24, we can't, you can't set times on this stuff. People have tried, and they've come up looking pretty foolish. So we can't do that. We have to be very careful, and I, and I warned you of this, uh, even when we looked at the whole Russia-Ukraine thing a couple of weeks ago. We have to be very careful that we don't make Scripture say what we want it to say based on the headlines in the news. We can't say many times, this is that. We can say, looks pretty interesting. Right? So we have to be very careful that we're not date setters. But we do have to know, look, this is, this, is, this is what we're told will happen. This is a rapture from that wrath. Because there's a certain way that we need to respond to this. And the first way we should respond to it is comfort. This should be comforting. What did we read at that that last verse in the reading this morning? Verse 18, therefore comfort one another with these words. Paul goes on into chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians and and he gives a better description of the judgment that's coming. And then he says this, very important, listen to this, verse 8 of chapter 5. But let us who live in the light be clear headed. In other words, Come on, think through. Don't get muddled with what's going on. Don't get overwhelmed with these things that will be happening. Protected by the armor of faith and love and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. In other words, saying, look, think clearly and remember your salvation. You've been saved from this. And then he wants to clarify. Look what he says. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. I I like the way the ESV translates this. Listen to this. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. What's he saying? He's saying this intense time of wrath that we we looked at. God is, he's he's not destined us for that. He's destined us for salvation. To pull us from those things. That's what he's saying. So we should comfort one another with these things. The second response that we should have is readiness. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 42, he said, therefore, be on the alert, for you don't know which day your Lord is coming. Say, man, could it be today? There is no sign in Scripture that has to be fulfilled in order for Jesus to come to rapture his church. Nothing. It it could be any time. We call this the imminent return of Christ. In other words, imminence means any time. It could happen at any time. So the question this morning is, are you ready? Are you ready? If you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, can I tell you, Based on the scriptures that we looked at earlier, part of the reason he has not come yet is because his desire and his goal is for you to repent, 
to, for you to come to a point in your life where you understand that there's no way that you'll ever be good enough to stand before a perfect God. And that's why he sent Jesus to pay the price for your sin, to give you an opportunity to have the debt paid for. See, justice comes for those who have unpaid debts. But when your debt's been paid for, justice has been satisfied. So if you've never placed your faith and trust in Christ, part of the reason he's holding back is for you. Are you ready? He's calling you to repentance. You say, Rand, what does repent mean? It means change your mind about yourself. I'm not as good as I thought I was. I thought maybe I would be good enough to get before God, but I, I, I realize that I've got to be perfect, and I know I'm not that guy. So you've got to change your mind about yourself. You've got to change your mind about your sin. My sin is worse than I thought it was. When I compare it with other people's, mine doesn't look so bad. But when I compare it with a holy God, I come out on the short end of that stick every time. So I have to change my mind about myself, my sin, and my Savior. I'm not good enough to save myself. I'm guilty. How could I possibly save me? I, I can't pay an infinite debt. I'm a finite creature. There's no way I can pay an infinite debt. Only an infinite being could pay an infinite debt. And that's Jesus Christ. And you have to come and, and accept what he's done for you. And that's how you get your sin free. It's not about going to church. It's not about giving money to good causes. It's not about being a good person. It's about fully realizing your sin is an offense to a holy God and there's no way to get that taken care of unless you come in full repentance before this God who loves you enough to hold back the justice he has to bring because he's a just God. Are you ready? Lord, I come before you this morning and I Thank you that you have revealed to us some of these deep things in your word. Especially in the days that we live, Lord, to bring us comfort. You said that we are to comfort one another with these words. So, Lord, I pray that those of us this morning who know you as Savior, that we haven't been freaked out, but that we, we've been comforted. Wow, this is great news. <laughs> this, is, this is amazing news. Lord, I pray for any that may be here this morning and they, they know that they have never fully put their faith and trust in you as Lord and Savior. They've been holding out for whatever reason or maybe they just didn't know. Maybe, maybe it's, it's just this ignorance that you talked about in Acts. That, but now you're calling them to repentance. You're calling them to change their mind about themselves, their sin, their Savior and turn to you God, I pray, I pray that they would do that. There's nothing that any of us can do. Certainly, there's nothing I can do. That is a heart issue. And God, I pray that you would just enlighten their spiritual eyes and may they see you for the amazing God that you are and may they run to you and cling to the forgiveness that only comes through Jesus. Pray, God, that, that these things would, would also motivate us. Motivate us as, as the Thessalonians were so motivated that they were worried about others in their, in their whole thoughts of, the, hey, Jesus could come back at any time. What does that mean about this person and that person? And may, may that motivate us as well as we look at our family, as we look at the people around us in our neighborhood, as we look at the people that we work with. God, may motivate us to get the truth of the saving faith of Jesus to them. Thank you for your goodness, your grace, and your patient hand as it holds back this judgment we know that ultimately has to come. In your name we pray. Amen.